Hello, Will. My name's Steph, and I'm one of your tutors for this semester. My name is Alan. I'm Manu. I'm Stella. This is Liam. I'm Izzy. Welcome to Foundations of Algorithms. Welcome to Foundations of Algorithms. You will all soon find yourselves with a lifelong love for algorithms. It's going to be a really awesome semester. So good luck. Enjoy the ride. Algorithms are fun. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Foundations of Algorithms, the University of Melbourne's introduction to the art of algorithmic design and creation. As well in this subject, we'll be learning the C programming language, but a little more on that later. Today, you'll see around you approximately half of our 450 students enrolled, hopefully more of them to come. These people will soon hopefully quickly become your friends. But for those of you who are coming from a computer science major background, you might be surprised to learn that we have more than six degree programs represented in this class. In fact, a very significant fraction of the people in this class have only ever taken one computer science course before, or in some cases, none at all. We have nine wonderful tutors who will be accompanying us on this journey. You can see some of their faces here. All of them were introduced in the video. And for those of you lucky enough to have a Friday workshop, you will be meeting them this week. Yes, we have scheduled the first week of workshops starting on Friday to accommodate for holidays later in semester. For all the rest of you, workshops begin immediately on Monday week two, and we'll start covering the, the material that we'll cover in the course today, tomorrow, and the day after. We have three lectures per week. Hopefully by now all of you have seen the syllabus video that was posted to the LMS and to YouTube. And for the rest of semester, you'll be invited to watch the class recordings that will be uploaded a few days after the class to give us time to edit and prepare them, that will then be uploaded to YouTube and the class website, which again is posted, was in the Canvas announcement, is on our ed page, algorithmsare.fun. That's algorithms are fun. Um, and if you want to see how to go to that, I have a video of typing it into the browser bar up on the LMS for those of you who have not yet discovered your web browsers. We have two lecturers, uh, myself, Dr. Shan Ankoni. I'm a lecturer in cybersecurity at the University of Melbourne, and I teach this and an information security course in the second semester. But along with myself, we also have... Hi, everyone. Uh, you might have recognized my voice on, on the like, trailer video. Um, now it's the face. Uh, <laughs> to see you all here. Wonderful. Full house. Thank you. And that is, of course, Dr. Jian Zhongqi, who is a senior lecturer in the School of Computing and Information Systems and, in fact, works on algorithms. So more from him later, and uh, he will be giving a good number of lectures later in the semester. And as you'll see in the coming weeks, as you write your own code and solve your own problems, what ultimately matters in this course is not so much where you end up relative to your classmates, but where you end up relative to yourself when you began. And it really is all about that delta, whether you've programmed or not, just getting something out of a class like this. And, and if it does take time, and if you do feel those frustrations, but you simultaneously eventually feel that sense of accomplishment, that, that just means it's all working, and indeed, hopefully, uh, all the more worthwhile and gratifying, ultimately, as a result. So that was a professor who teaches a similar course elsewhere, and in this class, we're going to take his teaching philosophy on board, which is the thing that matters is not at the end of the day whether you get 99 out of 100. Of course, that would be nice. All of us would like to be 100% uh, students. But what really matters is the delta between where you are now and where you are in two weeks from now, once you've spent a little time trying, where you are in six weeks from now, and where you are at the end of the course after you've put in the hours and put in the effort. What is algorithms? Why are we here? What are we talking about? What's the whole point of this? Well, one way of thinking about it is that algorithmics is the art of efficient problem solving. Anyone can solve a problem by trying every possible combination, uh, let's say you want to figure out the best way to pack things into the bag. You try your water bottle first, and then your lunchbox, and that doesn't work, so you put the lunchbox in, then the water bottle, then your laptop, that doesn't work. Anyone can try that. Algorithmics is the art of finding better ways to do things. In fact, that problem of packing a knapsack is one of the hardest types of problems in computer science, but maybe more on that as we get to uh, the end of the course. So this course would be useless if we all had infinity time and infinity resources on our hand. After all, the brute force approach of just trying everything would work perfectly fine. So our challenge here is given certain limitations, which we're going to impose on ourselves, what is the best we can do? 
What if we have a very small computer with a limited amount of memory? What if we have a larger computer? What if we have every computer that we could possibly fit in the universe? What could we do then? This is the design, this is the aim of this course, is to try and figure out answers to some of those questions and to do so in a rigorous but understandable way. So many of you uh, might be of the age where you no longer are familiar with uh, one of these. This is in fact a computer. This is what it looked like. I think my first computer looked something similar to this. Now, of course, computers are everywhere. You can fit them in the palm of your hand. And there are orders and orders of magnitude different, difference between the power in your iPhone and the power in this Macintosh. In fact, this can perform over 100,000, uh, can perform operations over 100,000 times slower, sorry, your iPhone can perform operations over 100,000 times faster than this Macintosh over here. So that's going to give us another interesting angle to think about things, not just what is theoretically possible, but what is possible with the computers that we have and use. Does anyone know what this is? Yeah. This is an Enigma machine. What was your name? Leo, lovely to meet you. So when I ask you a question, be sure to preface with your name. I'll try and remember as many of those as I can throughout the semester. So Leo pointed out that this is an Enigma machine. Now what is an Enigma machine? It is a machine for encryption. This is from before the computer era when German spies wanted to send message to messages to other Germans during World War II. What they would do is they would type the message on the keyboard above and then a light would flash up uh, on the dashboard showing them what letter they should write down. So if they typed in the word hello, the letters that flash might be JQRS. These letters don't match up with the letters that they originally typed in, but someone who has the same Enigma machine with all the cables plugged in the exact same way at the other end could type those letters that came out, J, Q, R, N, or whatever it was, type that in and get hello back again. So the Enigma machine is a mechanical form of computer. And it's particularly interesting to us because it's gonna provide some of the motivation for the very first algorithmic puzzle that we'll study. So let's hear a little bit more about that. In post-World War I Europe, secrecy between paranoid nations becomes paramount. The growth of international commerce creates a need for companies to keep their information secret from competitors. Germany's Arthur Scherbius develops the Enigma machine as a means of keeping those business transactions secure. It works by generating an electric current when a letter key is pressed. A number of moving mechanical parts then scramble the path of the current, producing a different letter each time the key is pressed. The Enigma machine is about to become the German Army's most powerful code-making weapon in World War II. So here's an example of a ciphertext, the encrypted output of one of the Enigma machines. So imagine that we in this room are all the allies, we're working to defeat the Nazis, and we want to figure out what they're saying. How do we do that? Well, one way of potentially cracking the code is to find all the places where there are repeated letters, because that might give us information about what the configuration of the Enigma machine is and what kind of words uh, were actually in the original plain text. That is, the original plain language message that the Germans were trying to send. Um, so let's try to efficiently find all these repeats. Um, and in this case, we're going to start with something simpler than that German ciphertext over there. Let's start with this string fat.rat.e.bat.cat.eat.fat.rat and see if we can find all the places where there are repeated letters in this, what we will call a string, a sequence of characters. In this case, we're going to look for all repeats that are at least seven letters in length, and we're going to say we want to change it to six letters in length or eight letters in length. We're going to use a variable m to represent the number of letters, the length of the repeat that we're looking for. So uh, let's, I've written some code earlier that'll allow us to demonstrate this. And yeah, you should be seeing that. This is find repeats zero, and I'm going to feed in the text of war and peace, the first thousand characters. And let's run the program and see what happens. Okay, so it's produced some output. It says there are 72 repeats, and it's also giving us the uh, locations at which they are. So at the very start of war and peace, there's the words the proj. We don't know what's there because we're only looking for repeats of seven in length, but her proj is repeated at location 226. So this worked pretty well. 
Um, it was relatively fast. My computer didn't have any problem doing it. Seems like we've got a good algorithm on our hands, right? Well, how does this work? This is the algorithm. Now, for those of you who haven't seen an algorithm before, it's just a representation of different steps that a computer might take to solve a problem. Don't worry if the details of this algorithm are a little too complicated for you today. The main point is to illustrate the idea of improving algorithms over time as our conditions get more constrained. So I'll talk you through this algorithm and we'll do so with the help of my iPad with which we'll actually run through this. So there is my string over there. Uh, there is the algorithm in the corner and we're going to simply follow the steps. So you'll notice that our algorithm runs sets up something called i that points at the very start of the string and has something called j over there that starts at the next letter. So our j will go over here. And then we have two loops. Loop, one that loops over a lot of different values of i and one that loops over a lot of different values of j. At each, within the double loop, we are then going to compare m characters over here, let me uh, raise some of this and make it a little bigger so you can see it. There we go. We're then going to compare m characters from both where i is and where j is and check that they match. If all the characters are the same, then we're going to say that we've found a match. So we already have a question. We notice that our loop doesn't go from i to the end of the string and we'll call the end of the string n. So let's make that n over here we see in our loop condition that i actually only goes to n minus m. Does anyone have an idea of why this might be? Why don't we let i go all the way to the end of the string? Yes, and what was your name? Eugene. Yeah, so if we're looking for a repeat of seven letters in length, Eugene is right that if we get to the second last letter and look for the seven letters following the second last letters, there aren't, there aren't actually enough letters there. So we get the second last letter, the last letter, and then the letter after the last letter, which doesn't make no sense. So we're already seeing to, uh, starting to understand why we've got the conditions on our loops that we do. What about j equals i plus one? Why do we start j over here and not at the same place as i? If we're looking for repeated patterns, yeah. And your name? Nia. Yeah, so if we're asking, is there a match, if you're looking at the, from the start and also looking from the start again, well, of course, if you're looking at the first three letters and the first three letters, they're the same letters. You haven't compared anything different. You're comparing the same thing to itself. So in order for us for this question to be posed in a meaningful way, we're going to start comparing fat with at dot. Now, do fat and at dot match? No. So what our algorithm is gonna do, it's going to look at the next set. Do fat and t dot r match? No? Okay, so we're gonna keep going. Um, and here I've got a brief animation. You can see that we're gonna keep moving j along each time to try and see if the sequence of letters starting at that position matches. So here I'm just doing with m equals three because it's a lot faster to do on the iPad. So is there a match for fat anywhere else in the string? Can anyone see, is fat, does fat appear a second time? Where does it appear? Over here. So when j gets up to here, so j is gonna start there, it's gonna go there, dot, dot, dot. j is gonna check all these places, it's gonna check at dot, it's gonna check t dot r, it's gonna check dot ra. And I've written this out in this little table over here. It checks at dot r, t dot r, dot ra, dot rat, until eventually it gets to fat over there and we find our match. And then the program, if we go back to our algorithm, it says if all m characters are the same, then write an output line. This works fine, um, but how about with bigger strings? Is this still gonna work? Let's try it instead of with war and peace uh, with the first thousand characters. Let's try it with the first 10,000 characters. Okay, that, that still ran. I'm gonna time it just to see. I'm gonna use the time command. It worked and it took under a second. So, you know, still, still no problems. Our algorithm's good. That's with 10,000 words. 
What about with 100,000? Okay, that's taking a little longer. Now our algorithm isn't so efficient, and I really want to know all the repeats in the text in order so that I can crack the code. Let's give it another few seconds, and it's still not going to get there. So now I'm going to start this one running with, okay, that is the largest file, and I'm just going to leave it going, and we'll, we might come back at the end of class and see uh, if our algorithm is finished. That is find repeats zero. So our program doesn't work so well once we start looking for repeats in a text that's really large. So this pr uh, prompts the question, how does the amount of time taken grow as our text grows? If I double the amount of text I have, does that double the amount of time that it takes? Does it quadruple the amount of time that it takes? You've got an answer already? What's your guess? Um, if it's checking the, the entire sequence, like the three letters or whatever, over the entire scene, like not just going, well, that's the wrong letter at the start, and then as you... We'll, we'll get back to that point. What was your name? Dylan. Sorry? Dylan. Dylan. Okay, so Dylan said, you know, there's something inefficient about this. Maybe we don't need to check all the letters. He's right, but we're not quite there yet. We want to figure out how to characterize the behavior of, um, of the algorithm in a way that tells us proportionately to the letters that we add, that we're checking, how long does it take? And we'll, we'll, we'll get back to this in a minute. If you know the answer, great, but we're going to catch everyone else up. And so this is a formal way, a more formal way of asking the question. We're not up to the really formal way yet. Maybe either John Jong and I will tell you more about that in week four. But we want to know not just the time needed, but also, also the memory needed, because our computer only has so much memory in it, and we're going to want to ask, is our computer actually going to be able to solve this problem with the memory that it has? So later in class, we'll talk about big O notation, but we'll give you just a teaser now. This is a form of providing an answer to how do things grow when I grow the size of my input. And it's what we call asymptotic analysis because we don't really care at the start, okay, if I had three letters or five letters or six letters, it doesn't matter so much. What I want to know is how the behavior grows writ large. So if I double, if I quadruple, if I multiply it by a power of two, by a power of three, then how does the input grow? So we don't care about the little nitty gritty things at the beginning, we care about the big picture. So this is a uh, representation of a number of different what we call complexity classes for, uh, for big O. So not complexity classes, sorry. A number of different uh, big O runtimes for algorithms. So you can see that uh, if our input grows in, if the amount of time that it takes to solve a problem grows linearly with the size of the input. So for example, if I add three letters and that takes three more time steps for my program to finish, that's a linear relationship. If I add twice the number of, uh, if I double the number of letters, but the, um, the amount of time that it takes goes up by the square of that, then we get an n squared behavior. Likewise, with all these different classes, you can see that uh, as you add additional input, the behavior of the algorithm can vary pretty wildly. So as n is going to be the number of items that we're checking, okay, the number of words in our string, or the number of items we're trying to fit in the bag, or whatever our algorithm happens to be measured by, that's our n, and then our big n over there is the amount of time that it takes. So if we increase the amount of items we have, does the amount of time that it takes go up really fast, or does it go up pretty slow as we add more items? And that's fundamentally the question that we're going to be asking for the rest of semester. So why is our algorithm so slow? So Dylan, do you want to uh, give give us back your what you were saying before? Was it Dylan? Yeah, um, so because it has redundancy. In it. Say it again. There's redundancy in because it says um, uh, compare n characters starting at si, and I can't say the rest of them. That's fine. So why might we not need to compare all m characters? Someone else? Yeah, name. Michael. In this case, I believe you're checking every permutation, so you're kind of doubling up in a sense where if you check i and you check j, j and i are um, the same, then you'll actually have a case where they're checking like the opposite, where they're kind of swapped. So instead you want to check every combination, so because the order in this case. So not quite. This is not a combination permutation one, but nice try. Anyone else? 
why don't we need to check all M characters? Yeah, at the back. What was your name? Tom. If you have one repeat early on and then the same chain repeats again, is, would that affect it? So let's, let's try this out and we'll see on the iPad why. Let's say we have two st strings that we're checking. I have A, B, C, D, E, F, and I want to look for a repeat of length three. I'll do it that way. So I starts there, J starts here. Okay, and we compare and we'll make M equal to three. So we're looking for repeats of length three. Now we say that every time we're going to compare M characters. So M characters is three characters. So we're gonna compare ABC with BCD. Now let's see if there's a place where I can stop early, if I can stop comparing. So are A and B the same? Are A and B the same letter? Okay, I'm gonna go on. Are B and C the same letter? Are C and D the same letter? So is it a repeat? Could I have figured that out earlier? Yeah, what could I have done? Just shout it out. Yeah, I could have stopped at the A. And so I don't actually need to compare three letters at all. In fact, the first time that I see a mismatch between the two things that I'm comparing, I can stop early. So this is going to be one of our, the first principles of algorithmic design that we encounter, which is this idea of early termination if you already know for some reason that you've solved the problem, which we do in this case. So now let's try and do some analysis of this algorithm and figure out actually how long it's going to take. So we have two loops. Now let's assume that n is always gonna be much bigger than m. War and Peace is a lot larger than the size of a repeat. If we were looking for a repeat the size of War and Peace, that would just be two copies of War and Peace next to each other. Not particularly interesting. So in the case of our code cracking, what we're looking for is where the size of the thing that we're looking in for repeats is big and the size of the repeat themselves is small. So this means n is much bigger than m, n, n for Norman, much bigger than m for Michael. And so for the purposes of our algorithm, we're just going to say that these loops run a maximum of n times. So if our outer loop runs n times and our inner loop runs n times each time the outer loop runs, what is the overall amount of time that the stuff in the inside is gonna run? Yeah. n squared because we do n things, then 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 n, and we do that n times. So n, n times is n squared. And then how many times does the inner thing run? How long does it take to compare m characters? Let's assume that a comparison takes one step. How, yeah, it takes, it, let's just leave it at m for the sake of, uh, of uh, ease. So we have n squared multiplied by what, what did you just tell me? You just said m. Yeah. yeah, so n squared and then m. What's n squared by m? n squared m. That, that's all we've got. What was your name? Jin Jie. Jin Jie. Okay, might take me a little time, but uh, you can remind me. Okay, so we have n by n by m. That gives us n squared m individual character comparisons, assuming that we're uh, ignoring some of how the computer works. Uh, we're ignoring the uh, n minus m, et cetera. Um, and we are, uh, yeah, we're just doing those character comparisons. Now, if I actually look at the computer code that's being generated when I run the program, this looks really complicated, don't worry about it. For those of you in the more comfortable workshops, you might see some of this. This is the actual instructions that the computer executes. And this is one comparison. But one comparison is not one instruction. In fact, it's about 10 instructions. So the other way of thinking about how long my program takes to run is to do the calculation, but to factor in the fact that uh, for each comparison, it's gonna take us 10 steps. So given, let's, let's pick some numbers. For 1,000 characters of War and Peace, repeats of length 10. N squared M gives us 10 to the power of seven. Uh, my laptop can do about, this, this laptop over here can do about 10 to the 10 uh, operations per second of whatever the operations happen to be. Um, each comparison takes about 10 instructions. That gives us 10 to the eighth divided by 10 to the 10, which is about one thousandth of a second. Great. But 
let's make the numbers bigger and do our calculation for the large text file that we were looking at. So when n is a million and m is 100, then n squared m is 10 to the 14. Multiply that by 10 again to get the actual number of comparisons that it's going to take to run. And then we get almost 30 hours for this program to run. So it's very clear that n squared m is not efficient program behavior, at least for this algorithm that we're trying to run. So some of you will have heard of Moore's law, which is this idea that processes get faster. In fact, they double in speed almost 18 months. Well, that's a bit of a misrepresentation. Firstly, Moore's law was about the density of transistors on a microchip. But secondly, something happened. Does anyone know what happened? What happened to Moore's law? Yeah, and your name? Uh, Lucas. Lucas. Yeah, it stopped doubling for a, for a great period from about the 70s till about 2010. We experienced this rapid doubling of both density of transistors and also of computing power roughly every 18 months. But since 2010, thing, progress has started to slow. So we can't just rely on our computers getting faster every two years to power our way out of this problem. In fact, if we were going to uh, rely on Moore's law even if Moore's law was still working, it would take roughly 20 years for the program that takes 30 hours to get down to the pace of the smaller program on my laptop. So evidently just saying get a more powerful computer is not the answer to the problem. So as we explored before, we can do much better on average because on average the number of comparisons that we're going to re be required to do is not to check all the letters because most of the time we're not going to find a repeat, we're going to find a not repeat. And for every not repeat, chances are that the first letter doesn't match, so we can just stop as soon as we find the first non-matching letter, as we said before. So here's our new algorithm. Um, compare at most m characters, starting at si and sj, stopping as soon as any discrepancy is noted. Already much better. This is going to give us how much of an improvement, on average. It, it's kind of rough, but... Yeah, what was your name? Yeah, so this will give us roughly a factor of, uh, of M improvement, but it's, that, that's not precise because the chance that the first character does match is roughly 1 in 26, assuming that we're just using letters of the alphabet. But hand wavy, this will save us a little bit. However, is N squared or M much, much larger? What's the larger part of that? Yeah, it's the N squared. So this really isn't going to solve our problem. The amount of time that things take is still going to grow much, much faster as the size of our input grows. So worst case is still going to be N squared M because in the worst case, we're going to check all M minus 1 characters, all M minus 1 characters, all M minus 1 each time, or that we're going to find repeats over and over. So the worst case is still N squared M, but on average, we only check the first K letters. K is going to be much smaller than M, faster, but not fast enough. Um, when n is a million, we still need to do at least 10 to the 12 comparisons. Still going to take quite a while, at least a thousand seconds. So this is what computer science, as opposed to programming, is all about. It's understanding the nature of the problems and the nature of the algorithms that we are designing. It's not just write some code that works. It's write some code that works within certain constraints, within certain boundaries, and try and optimize not just the code that you've written, but the design of it in a way that makes the problem tractable with the resources you have. One thing that we're going to be talking about a lot in this class is the idea of a space-time trade-off. Now, uh, you'll have to forgive me there. It's, uh, there is a dash between them, but I, I happen to like the picture of the wormhole, so we're going to go with that. And this is pretty much the idea that by consuming extra amounts of your computer's memory to save some information, then later on, you can come back and use that information to speed up the thing you're working on. So by some clever storage of information, you can make your algorithm much faster. Now, where might this be most useful? This is a broad general question. Where is going to be saving stuff ahead of time be most useful? Yeah. Say? Repeated tasks, and your name is? Sahil. So Sahil says, if we're going to do a task over and over and over, so let's say we're going to run find repeats 50 times, it's going to make a lot of sense to do some hard work and save some memory ahead of time. And then every time that we do uh, find repeats, all those other 50 times, it'll be faster because we've done work ahead of time. This is the space-time trade-off, or the time-space trade-off, either way. 
So what we're going to do, use to actually store our things ahead of time are called data structures. Now they, these are an abstraction, they're not a physical thing. If you look inside your computer for a spreadsheet, are you gonna find a spreadsheet inside your computer sitting there somewhere? No, of course not, that's ridiculous. It's a file with certain structure. Um, and just like an Excel spreadsheet or like files and folders, these describe structural relationships between data that is just stored anywhere inside the computer's hard drive or inside the computer's temporary memory. So the point here is to cleverly arrange the links between the data so that it's efficient for your computer to read and also saves you time when you're later uh, running some algorithm. So the challenge here is to design the right tools, both the algorithms and the data structures that you use to speed up the algorithms to overall make improvements to what you're doing. Now, here's an example of a data structure that we're going to use for our current problem. The, here you'll see the string that we've been going on all about before, fat.rat.eat, etc. And then in the second line, I'm going to repeat the same thing, copy the entire string except for the first letter. In the third line, I'm going to repeat the entire string except uh, starting from the third, then the fourth, then from the fifth, then from the sixth. So this doesn't seem to give us much of a speed up yet. But I'm gonna do something kind of clever here. I'm going to order this by the where in the alphabet the string starts with. So if the string starts with A, it's gonna appear at the top. If it starts with B, it's gonna come next, C, E, and then what about if two things start with the letter A? Well, then I'll look at the second letter and arrange them alphabetically. And the third, if there's still a tie, third letter, and so on and so forth. Now, this data structure is called a suffix array, and we're not gonna talk a whole lot about how to make one right now, um, but it's gonna be useful for making our problem much, for making our algorithm much, much faster. And we will revisit it in something like week six. So there are a bunch of rules to this data structure that are gonna define what it is lexicographic sorting, which means the strings are sorted in this alphabetic way, except the, alphabet, the alphabetic sorting continues through each letter of it. Um, all the different suffixes of this original string are present, so because we've gone through the entire string and started from everything from the first letter, everything from the second letter, everything from the third letter, we know that every possible suffix is there. Um, each suffix is matched to where in the string it starts, that's the number on the side. And then this is probably going to be the most useful property for us, is that two strings that are similar to each other, that are most similar to each other out of any other string, are right next to each other. Who can see why this might be useful if we're looking for repeats? If we know that the two strings that are most similar to each other are next to each other. You've already answered, haven't you? And what was your name? Eugene. Okay, someone else. What was your name? Duck. Duck. Starts with what letter? E. e. Okay, you'll come up to me after and write it out for me. So you just have to look for the neighbor and you do not have to look for the entire database. So if a string is repeated, a repeated string is really, really, two repeated strings are really, really similar to each other. In fact, they're the most similar that any two strings could be. So if we're looking in our suffix array and we already know that the most similar strings are next to each other, then of course repeated strings are going to be right next to each other if they are in fact present. So who has an idea for our new algorithm? You just, just say it out loud, you don't have to give all the fancy details, just in plain English. What's our new algorithm? How can we find repeats? Dylan, you've already answered. Oh, you've already answered as well. What was your name again? Ruben, no, you haven't answered, have you? Okay, Ruben, go ahead. Um, maybe you just like check the neighbors until it fails and then you stop and say there's no more. Sounds really good. Let's let's back up a bit. What do we have to do before? Do we have what is this? Reorder it into a new Well, before we even get to the reordering, we have to make it, don't we? So let's make it. Then what do we do? Wait, wait, wait. We've, we've made it this, and then you, you said the other thing. We've, we've made it like this, then what do we have to do? Yep, reorder it. Then what do we do? You just said it before. Yeah, and now we check the neighbors. 
So that's a three-step process. Build the thing, sort the thing, and then check, all the, check each of the neighbors in, the, in our table. Now let's see what this algorithm looks like. Here we have exactly what Ruben just said in English, only now we've put it in pseudocode, this algorithmic description of our problem. So read in the sequence, make the table, that's our bit at the top over there, sort the table, and then compare at most m characters using the optimization we found before, are looking at two, at each adjacent pair of strings in the table, because we know that if there's a repeat there, it's going to be in adjacent entries in the table. So if there are no differences are found between the two adjacent items, then write the string. This is useful for finding one instance of each repetition, and as a take-home exercise, I encourage you to go back and think about what would be the way that we could find all repetitions. It's really not a big modification to this, um, but that's something for you to think about. So what is the running time of this algorithm? Let's think the same way that we got n squared m before, let's do it for, um, for our new algorithm. And here's the big hint, we'll get to this later in semester how to prove this, but sorting k items takes on average k log k. So who wants to take a stab at it? We'll do it step by step in, with the three steps that we uh, got so far. Build the thing, sort the thing, look through the thing. Before I, yeah, uh, what was your name again? Edward, okay. Edward, so how long does it take to do our first for loop? Our for loop goes from zero to n minus m, and we know that n is much bigger than m, so how long does this take? n, okay, n plus, how long does it take to sort something of length n? n log n, so this is n plus n log n, um, and then how long does it take us to do the next for loop? n m, so we have n plus n log n plus n m, and which is the biggest? So we will talk a bit more about this later. M n log n is the biggest out of these factors, and so um, we have our final running time for this bit of code. So that seems like quite an improvement. Um, let's run this on the computer and see what we get. Well, that's still going. I'm actually gonna stop it because it'll take too much time to... This is with the small improvement that we made. And this is with our new big improvement. You can see it's now almost instant one second. We now have three different methods. We have our naive method where you do all, where you check all M characters every time. We have our method one, stop early. So instead of checking all M characters, check until there's a mismatch. And then we have our third one with our beautiful data structure which speed things up considerably. So with 10,000, you can see that this takes, that it still is pretty fast to run no matter which algorithm you pick. Once you get to a million, we don't even know how long this is taking for our zeroth method. It was so long that my laptop wouldn't run it. Um, it takes about a thousand seconds if we stop early uh, with, the, with the checking. And then it takes less than a second using our suffix array. And now when we move to 10 million, methods zero and one can't sol really solve the problem at all on my laptop in a reasonable amount of time. But method two with a suffix array is still working super well. Even with 100 million, this is finishing in a reasonable amount of time. And then with a billion, we can make estimates that this will take a few minutes, uh, 24 minutes on my laptop, under half an hour, 35 years, uh, years on uh, with the stopping early, and then three millennia if we used our naive version. So this gives you an idea of the power of making small adjustments to the algorithm to improve the overall runtime behavior. So are we done? Can we, can we go home? We can still do a lot better. Half an hour? Ha, I want this done in a second. So there are a few ways we can go about doing this. We could use a better sorting algorithm. So m n log n is normally how long sorting takes, but we can optimize this a bit. There are some specialized algorithms that work really well for strings. Um, so this takes 50 seconds to sort 50 megabytes. And this would be about a few hours of programmer time once you finish the class, hopefully a few hours of your time, and you could do this method, improving things quite a lot. We could go the other direction and focus on a better suffix array construction mechanism. So maybe uh, we can double our speed again, it's probably be a few days of work. In fact, John Jung, have you done work on uh, suffix array construction or is that just Alistair? Just Alistair. Just Alistair. So 
uh, Alistair Moffat, who teaches the other semester of, of his course, this is some of his research, is figuring out how we can better construct suffix arrays. And this is still an active area of research, as we'll talk about later in semester. There are still improvements to be made here, and maybe when you finish the class and take a couple more classes, maybe you two will find a way to more efficiently solve this problem. What was that? Edward? Well, we're getting there. We're getting there. You're, that's very far ahead. Um, so we can still do better. What are some other ways we can do better? Well, as Edward mentioned, we can go to the actual machine code, the actual code that the computer is running, and instead of writing in Python or in C or in a language that humans ordinarily understand, we can write computer language and use a single instruction multiple dispatch code, as Edward said, but please do not worry about that. If you're confused about it, go to the advanced tutorial and ask your tutor there, and maybe they'll even have a hard time explaining it. So, using this fancy schmancy assembly code, we can maybe cut the time in half again, um, so we're doing pretty well. We can still do better, we're still not there. After years of research making our better suffix array, after days of programming, after using our fancy SIMD instructions and assembly, we're still not there. We can still do better. Anyone know what this is? Yeah. Yeah, this is a modern Intel CPU, or relatively modern. This is the actual thing that makes your computer work. Now, how many of these things are there? Roughly. There are 10 of them. There are 10 different individual computing units inside your computer, each of which can run the instructions. So if we're running our algorithm, how many of these is our code designed to run on? One, right? So that's not great. We have 10 of these inside our ordinary laptop or inside at least uh, this laptop. This laptop, I think, has uh, 12, 12 cores in it. So we could write a program that can run on all 12 at once if we come up with a clever way to split up the work. But our algorithm isn't designed for this, so we'd need to redesign our algorithm to split up the work and take advantage of the 12 cores. Um, so let's go to another method. And let's see if it's even on here. Um, looks like I don't have these on here. For, I'll post them online. But we have a version that is parallelized. Method four uses more disk space, so it has to store some of the information to help split up the work. That's, that's our trade-off that we talked about before. It's also a bit more complex, so if you're running it on a computer with one core, it's not gonna be as fast, but it can process 100 million strings in seven days, or on one core, or 10 minutes if we spread it, spread it across 1,024 processes. So this is where we're starting to get to the level of supercomputers that have a lot and a lot of these cores. Where else on a modern gaming computer might you find a lot of cores? The GPU. The GPU, and for those of us who don't know, what's a GPU? Graphics card, yes. Yeah, so the graphics card inside your computer is being used more and more to help do parallel processing. So splitting up an algorithm into lots and lots of different pieces, having it run on each of the individual processing units inside the graphics card, and then combining them together after. And this, which is unfortunately outside of the scope, is how all the modern AI tools that you've been seeing come out, like ChatGPT and Stable Diffusion and MidJourney, all of them rely on splitting up the algorithm across the GPUs, using this same technique to parallelize it really, really widely. So the lesson here is that problems can be solved at multiple levels. We have our naive basic version, which will solve the problem, but we can get more and more sophisticated and more and more complex and arrive at solutions that are better tailored to certain scenarios. Now, of course, parallelizing this to a supercomputer doesn't make sense when all you're trying to do is look for repeats in the first 10,000 words of War and Peace. This is not that method four is better than method one. It's that uh, they are customized to different scenarios. If it's gonna be much, much faster for you to code method zero and you only need to solve a very small problem, method zero will probably be best. But if you're trying to do something massively parallel, like look through all the text on the internet, method zero is the wrong way to go. It'll be worth expending all that effort to make the better algorithm. So this is gonna be another theme of the class. What will your algorithm actually be used for? What is the right tool for the job? And this is what makes computer science fun. Mm -hmm.
I'm designing a machine that will allow us to break every message every day instantly. I'm just a mathematician. Sometimes it is the people who no one imagines anything of who do the things that no one can imagine. Enigma Cipher. Thank you very much, everyone. I'll see you tomorrow.